Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Candice. Um, thank you all for joining. And as Candice mentioned today, we'll talk about misconfigurations. And I labeled this catch me if you can, because we're talking about something that might be or can be a bit elusive sometimes to notice and, and detect. To kick this off, I'd like you to imagine your the person on the left, it's your first day at a new company. You're the first security hire, maybe in a small startup. And as you're walking in, people welcome you, or they hand you your computer, like any other things. And as they're welcoming you into your new job, they also hand you a really long to-do list. Um, they ideally would like you to start working on like immediately, right? And you might be wondering, so what exactly is the job then in that case? Like, what am I supposed to do specifically as a security person in a fast moving startup or up and coming startup? And what it comes down to, or what we'll at least focus on today is making sure that you keep the company and company data safe or the company infrastructure and company data safe in an environment that can move really quickly. And what I mean by moving quickly is that we have developers or like other uh, teams that are delivering changes really quickly. We want to make sure that whatever they do like is all or like whatever anybody is doing in a company, right? Like is, is all safe and secure. To make this a bit more specific, when we look at security and security engineers and software developers, um, we put this like on, on a on a spectrum, if you will. We have security on one end and developers on the other. And I'm I'm oversimplifying a bit to to make the point here, but so bear with me. But when we think about it, developers, the measuring stick, like in, in a simplified case, is how many features can you deliver in a period of time, in a week, in a sprint, quarter, or whatever your your time frame is in that case. Where for security, on the other hand, we want to make sure whatever changes are being introduced, that is everything safe, that we're not accidentally opening like a door or like a back door for an attacker to come in and do whatever, right? Like steal data or compromise our system in any in any kind of way. And so ideally, we'd like to make sure that like every change, like in this case, I'm, I'm just going to uh like we'll see a pull request on like on a platform like GitHub synonymously with like a change, right? So every change that comes in, we want to make sure is this like safe and secure. And like ideally we, we could sit down and, and review each change manually or like or like separately to make sure that whatever they're doing is uh up to spec. But then coming back to being like the first day at work. The, the CTO or your boss might be sitting down with you or like standing at a whiteboard and just to introduce you to the, the company infrastructure, right? So starting with, okay, we have like our main application is compromised or uh, sorry, is comprised of uh, I don't know, this many microservices. We have some databases here, some databases there. And maybe even like a few other managed services that are that we're leveraging to build this this uh, tool or like this product. And we're talking about a complex system here, right? Like, like this might be like a bunch of as I mentioned, like a bunch of microservices and everything. So the the application in itself is already complex. But then, and this is what we're going to focus a bit more on today. Here is. It's not just the application that's complex, but also the environment we're going to deploy this into, maybe AWS, GCP, or Azure, right? Um, because there is like, like a myriad of different platforms we can deploy this onto, like a EC2 compute, Kubernetes, uh, serverless, or whatever else there is, right? Like there's like a long list of possible deploy targets and like other services we can use. But then with that in mind, what is it that we're what we're trying to prevent, right? And think about 
in the morning you just um, you just had your first cup of coffee or cup of tea and you're turning on the news and suddenly this happens well it turns out your company is on the news and not in a good way your company is your company is on the news because somebody managed to break in or compromise uh, your environment and they managed to walk out maybe even the front door with all your customer or company data. And this is what we're working against, what we try to avoid at all costs. Even if your company doesn't hit the news, right? I mean, this is like really the worst case that can happen. I mean, break-ins happen and the news won't notice, which either way, it's still bad. And so this is what we're trying to avoid like, at all costs. And to change gears a bit, what we want to look at next is um, like a bit of like the day-to-day -day business of working at this company. So we might have a developer here who works on a new feature and they write their code, write tests, test all checkout, everything passed, and then create like, they do all their commits and then eventually once they're done, they push everything to GitHub or like their source control platform, create a pull request, have somebody else or like other team members review their code. And then it's time to merge the pull request. Then we might have like our automated deploy yeah, or like deploy pipeline or mechanism in place so that the deployment is successful eventually. And then it's time to try the feature and then we just see this. And I'm sure uh, all of us might have, or like all of you might have encountered something like this before where we just faced like some generic error message. We just wanted to, one last thing, we wanted to try this out in production because everything checked out locally as we tested this and um, and then we're presented with a generic error message. And it's just frustrating, right? Because you're already ready to move on to uh, your next ticket or like the next task. And then now there's this that needs to be needs to get fixed. So when we're looking at the logs, I'll start to troubleshoot this. Eventually we'll find out, okay, Apparently, there's like a like there's a permission denied error, so we're lacking some kind of permission uh, here, and that's what's causing this problem in the first place. And you might be thinking, okay, like it's not a big deal, but I really need to get on with my to do list. I like keep working off all my other tasks, so I'm just gonna go ahead and like seems like a policy was missing. I'm just gonna go ahead and deploy this new policy allow access on all resources, et cetera, just to make this go away because people want to use this and then we already see the first tickets and customer support coming in. People are complaining. Why am I seeing this error message? Like I can't do my work. And so we just need to make this go away. And that's where we encountered our first misconfiguration. And you might be saying like, but seems a bit doesn't seem right to just blame this on like software developers or developers right and you're right like this is not this here is not about assigning blame to a team or specific group in the company but what i'd like you to take away from this small example is how easy a misconfiguration can happen and granted in this case it's it's very exaggerated right where like somebody comes in and just uh, applies gr or like grants all permissions on everything just to make some error go away. Um, but the the important point here is a misconfiguration can happen faster than you might think, and it also might happen unintentionally. And that's the the bigger thing here as well to consider. So as I said, we just encountered our first misconfiguration, and if you might start thinking of like. Hmm, have I encountered any similar situations in the past? Have I done anything like that before? And just, and just your mind starts wandering off and wondering, and like, it seems rather like suddenly things start to become much more complicated or complex. And you might be feeling like the person on the right where you think like, I'm just going to do 
A and then do B and then my job is done, right? Or like I'm going to do A and then B happens and then we can move on to the next thing. But suddenly we have this, this I'm just going to call it like the, the complexity jar on the left that as soon as we open this, then there are so many more things to consider and like to take into account and it's just really overwhelming. Um, that's certainly the, the first time I learned about misconfigurations and what's associated with that. That's how I felt about it. The look at the, the, I guess like a more official definition of what, what a misconfiguration really is. Um, it is an incorrect or suboptimal configuration of this, of a system that may lead to vulnerabilities. And as I was researching this in preparation for this webinar, for the session, like another definition I came across mentioned, or like was very similar to this one, but it also mentioned that it's um, something that we don't do on purpose. And I think that's the big thing here that a misconfiguration can happen easily and unintentionally. I think that, that was what I was looking for, unintentionally. So we're not doing this on purpose, but this happens as we're just, for instance, rolling out a new feature into production or into our systems. And so to give you a better understanding of, or like a better feeling for like what, what, a, what counts as a misconfiguration, what should I start looking for in my own like code or um, systems, et cetera, I have a few examples here we like, to to consider. The first one here is an example and also already contains a bit of the, the remediation. And so this is a bit of Terraform code that we might run to uh, allow somebody to assume a role. And the misconfiguration here is that we might allow a user to assume a role um, without checking for multifactor multi-factor authentication, or in this case here, we want to make sure that somebody can only assume a role if they have multi-factor auth uh, enabled or configured, right? Otherwise an attacker quote unquote just needs to guess my password and then they have access to the system and then maybe like it really allows them, uh, allows lateral movement or something like that. Um, and so, here, what we're looking at is we say, okay, we, we need to assume roles or we need to, entities to assume roles in our AWS uh, infrastructure, but then we might haven't considered that enabling MF, MFA is something that we should do and also helps to prevent possible breaches, right? Another example that I think has been very prominently featured on the news is exposed storage buckets as publicly accessible as three buckets, even though they were supposed to be private for instance, or um, in the worst case, we have a bucket that stores or will store sensitive data and it's world readable. Everybody can access this. And that's, and there's been lots of cases uh, in the past where that has happened but even if you think well like today like whenever you create a new bucket on on amazon for an online aws for instance i think it's private by default so that's something it's quote unquote not as easy anymore to to make this mistake but even if you think about it even if the bucket is not world readable but you have a bucket where you store uh work Con like workers' contracts, salary information, or something like that. Um, and it's readable within the organization, suddenly it becomes a problem again, because now we're sharing information that wasn't supposed to be shared across uh, the entire organization. So this also counts as a misconfiguration. And the last example here is open ports. So. In this example here, we might have an, one or more EC2 instances and we associate a security group and in the security group, we'll just open all ports to maybe even the public, right? Or like, yeah, in this case, to the public. And I might be wondering, so what's the big deal with this? Because you might say, you know what? I, 
I just need to deploy something on this machine and need to access some of the, the services there. And I don't want to worry about what kind of ports are open or closed or go back into either my, my Terraform code or the AWS console to open more ports or close them again or whatever. So I'm just going to open all of them. And the problem here is that an attacker can go ahead and perform a port scan on the machine and see then in the results, see, okay, what kind of services are running here? And then if the service, like classic example, FTP, for instance, if we're running FTP in a version that's uh, vulnerable to some kind of attack, then they can attack that right away. Or if FTP it in itself is misconfigured in a sense that it allows anonymous access, then suddenly I might expose data to attackers or to outsiders that I didn't intend to share in the first place. And so these are just three examples of a almost like an endless, like a really long list of possible misconfigurations. And it's a bit like coming into an archive, right? And like you have a stack of boxes sitting in front of you with what it says here, right? Like this is all the stuff we know about so far, but we, we're sure if you go down the aisles, uh, there's much more, like we'll find much more stuff. And the important bit here is this is a problem you're unlikely to solve with just discipline and work ethic. And what I mean by that is because there are so many possible misconfigurations and also if you're in an environment where there's a lot of changes happening on a daily basis, like thinking of thinking of um, people sending pull requests and, and or scheduling deployments, it is not just not possible to keep track of all that manually, right? Like to just sit in front of the the GitHub pull requests tab and just go in and review each pull request one by one. Um, because even then, even if you manage to do all of that, it's gonna probably consume a good part of your day, of your work day. And also if somebody chooses to go into the AWS console directly to, to make some changes or to create a new bucket or something like that, you're not even aware of that. And so this is a problem that we need to solve with a, yeah, we need to solve with or by introducing new software. And that's where Panoptica comes into play. Panoptica is the, or Cisco's cloud application security solution and uh, we're part of Outshift. Outshift is the incubation group within Cisco. And in a broad, like in the broadest sense or like in a single sentence to describe what Panoptica is, it is focused on cloud security. If you heard the term CNAP before, C-N-A-P-P, um, Panoptica fits into that category. CNAP is a, I think it's called by Gartner. Um, and there's, there's a handful of software solutions that, that are in this category and Panoptica is one of them. And as I mentioned in a general sense, or like quickly explain, Panoptica focuses on cloud security. And what that means is if you, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> if you sign up uh, for an account and the first thing you do is you connect your, for instance, your AWS or GCP or Azure accounts. And what happens next is that Panoptica starts scanning and then you're presented with a dashboard like this where you see an overview of all the different findings. And while there's a lot to explore, there's, there's a lot of different aspects to cloud security. We'll, here we'll focus mostly or like exclusively on misconfigurations. Um, but what you see here is that as soon as you connect your one or more accounts, then it starts scanning and then you get overviews of, okay, how are we doing, for instance, in terms of compliance or are there any attack paths uh, to consider? And I'm gonna explain that in a second, what that means. Or what you see on the right-hand side, 
is there any, for instance, any malware malware that's found uh, that I need to do I need to address or need to remove? And so when we're looking at before we look at the very specific misconfiguration features, one thing I'd like to highlight is attack paths. What this does is it also shows us whenever there's a misconfiguration and an attack path highlights how an attacker might take advantage of a misconfiguration or in this case a CVE uh, to gain access or for instance, steal data. It doesn't mean that somebody has already done it. I think that's very important to highlight here. It just shows the possibility or like how somebody could do it. And I think that's a, because we're in such a complex environment, this is a very critical piece to that, to make sure that we understand, okay, how does somebody take advantage of a misconfiguration or CVE? And what we see here is in, in this specific example, on the right-hand side, we have an EC2 instance that has a handful of CVEs associated with it. An attacker can come in from any IP or any of these two security groups to access this machine and then, for instance, exploit a vulnerability. Excuse me. Um, and if we had any misconfigurations within, this, within the environment, then these also would show up here. And then the attack path is a tool that helps us to yeah like, like this is like a very reactive kind of work if you will right and if, if you think about it you come in in the morning you open your computer you sign in and if you think okay i really need, just need first of all i need to know is anything on fire right now is there any anything that is like drop everything and fix this is there any kind of work or like is, are there any kind of issues like that in our system attack paths highlight that uh, very well, right? Where I can go in and work these off one by one, for instance, before I um, yeah, consider any like doing anything else. So the next screen I would like to highlight or like the, the the capability really is a security posture. And this is what we see, what you see in, in the in the middle here. Um, there's a bunch of different risk categories to like that it, that we're scanning for, that what we see or what we show results for. Um, but the the thing I'd like to highlight here, what we're going to talk about here, is insecure configurations, and. We drill a bit deeper into this or looking at one in detail, we see here, what we have here is the example of the permissive access to S3 objects, right? This is like what, or like maybe even publicly accessible S3 bucket. That's the, the case what we're talking about here. And what you see in the background is there's a bunch more findings around IAM misconfigurations or uh, databases, cluster roles. So, it's not just focused, I mean, I only used S3 and a bit of IAM as examples here, but the, the scope is anything in your AWS account. And so um, what this allows us to do is, first of all, to drill into, uh, like, like look at this in more detail. So what is what exactly is the problem? We see related assets, which means, okay, there's in this case one, bucket that is affected by this. And we also get information on how to remediate, or like instructions on how to remediate this. What's important here to take away is that Panoptica doesn't automatically remediate anything for you, which means you're always in the driver's seat. You're always the person to make the decision of, are we going to address this? And then also, if we do, how are we going to do this? Panoptica only has read-only access to your accounts, and so there is no way or no chance for 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 us or for this tool to yeah like to to change anything without your notice or without your consent, right? And so yeah, the way how this like how to use this or like how to look at it is 
we look at the findings, and then if we decide this, this needs to be addressed, which is very likely given like the severity rating here, then uh, we can either send a link to somebody else to have them look at it and fix it, or create, for instance, create a ticket uh, in like a system like Jira to have somebody work this off or like to fix this. And the next one, the, the next thing we want to look at is the um, like CICD capabilities, like, like the, the names changed a bit recently on, on the screens. But what is this all about is, uh, when, let me go back one second. Here, we're looking at what's happening in production right now or in our environments. And it's a very, like a more reactive kind of working, right? Like somebody already deployed something and now we see or we get insight into what are all the problems and like what, what do we need to fix? And then if we fix this right now, then uh, there's no guarantee on like that this is fixed forever, right? Because if somebody runs their Terraform script again, for instance, then, or like some Terraform script, they might, they might introduce this, reintroduce this vulnerability again. And so what we'd like to do is we'd also like to, yeah, become more proactive in the sense, which means we also want to start scanning, not just our like, clusters and everything and configurations, but also our uh, repositories where we, for instance, keep Terraform code or um, uh, Kubernetes de definitions and things like that. And so as soon as I connect my GitHub repository, Panoptica also starts scanning those. And then as like what you see in the background here, there's a, for this repository here, there's a few findings, for instance, a generic secret, right? First of all, that there's a hard-coded secret or API key that was found. And then um, with a link to the, the file and then also with, with a bit more explanation on what the actual problem is. And this screen here doesn't provide as much information yet, but we're working really hard right now to deliver more features here. So this is something that, like this is a capability that will uh, improve a lot over the next few months. And so to wrap this up, what I'd like you to take away from this is that first of all, in in the yeah, like in the security space, we have reactive work and we have proactive work. Reactive is really what we talked about before in the previous screens. Um, looking at what's happening in production right now. Is there anything that we need to fix right away or fix eventually? And then we also have the more proactive work where we want to catch these kind of mistakes or misconfigurations before they even get they even get deployed. And a tool like Panoptica can help you to yeah like be more conscious of your time, right? Because there's there might still be a lot of work to go through. Like if you go back to one of these screens here, you see there's a lot of findings. So it might still take a while to get through all of these, but it's what it, um, I guess like the advantage here is that you don't have to find all of these manually, but this all happens behind the scenes as changes are being made, um, as people roll out new features, fix bugs, etc. This happens behind the scenes and so you can so you have more time to either fix this and also work with other team members to maybe even educate them on hey like we really should talk about our how we handle s3 buckets or policies around that um but then also to come in and like fix this right so if you think this was interesting or this piqued your interest or you think uh or, or you feel like you'd like to learn more i would like to invite you to join our academy it's free so you sign up for free and we are currently in a pr process of adding a lot of cloud security content so if you sign up right now um you see that there's already content there and we're rolling out new content 
every few weeks. Anything around CNAP, um, cloud workload protection, misconfigurations, vulnerability management. These are all things that are already either there or yet to come. And that concludes my slides. And I believe we have like a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, so let's see, we have, yeah, I think there's like two or three questions about how Panoplica compares with uh, Prisma Cloud from Palo Alto. Um, it's a good question. I don't have specifics on like, like a feature by feature comparison. What I can say is that we're very much or like somewhat on par with most of the features that the competitors have and we're currently working on enhancing that as we speak. And the, I know it's like not a very definitive answer of like, oh, we do this better and that better or like the others do this and that better. Um, the reason for that is that we're much newer to the market than some of our competitors. So when you look at our feature set right now or compare it to others, you will see some gaps, but we're working really hard right now to catch up and like to just be on par, but also to deliver more value that others don't have. Um, so I hope that that answers your question now. And okay. Oops. Uh, let's see. So if you have any other questions, I believe we have like a few more minutes at least, um, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. Otherwise, I really appreciate taking the time today to join the session and I hope that we can, yeah, that, that we can uh, welcome you as learners in our Panoptic Academy. I think I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, back to you, Candice. Thank you so much, John, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.